trains to transport nutrients and transport cell waste. Can you imagine trillions versus only one million? For every one gram extra, that is trillions of platelets more. So, it's, you know, unusual that somebody could have 65 uh, grams per litre of albumin. Somebody who doesn't eat, it's possible for them to have an enormous amount of albumin to transport things everywhere. So now what most people have eaten did not have any spare electrons in it. And maybe many of us may have not had any food which had any spare electrons, but if you drank your urine, you can get spare electrons. There's negative hydrogen ions in the urine and alkaline elements and things, and alkalizing elements in the urine. Uh, but most food that people can have eaten, uh, certainly commercial produce, very, very, very little negative hydrogen ion in commercial produce. You need that negative hydrogen ion because hydrogen is the major transporter of spare electrons everywhere in your body. If you could have enough electrons, you could live for 10,000 years. And just basically, we just sort of lessen, keep our electron flow, basically, that's all. And so that's so very important to be able to keep our electron flow. So most people can have eaten commercial produce which doesn't have any negative hydrogen ions in it. Most people can have eaten cooked food which absolutely, if it did have negative hydrogen ions before it started, before it was cooked, the cooking wipes all the negative hydrogen ions out. So, so if you've eaten cooked food, if you ate commercial food, if you ate food which was not sun ripened, then it's quite possible that you may not have, and certainly there is no negative hydrogen ions in flesh. Why is it that vegetarians keep their brains longer? Yes, there is no antioxidants in flesh. Wow. There is no vitamin in flesh. Really? The protein of what that most people eat in flesh-wise is undigestible, unassimilatable. Let's just take a leaf. and We look under the microscope at a leaf or any vegetation for the most part. It's possible to find about 10 microorganisms per gram. That's very few. We go immediately to anything from an animal. Milk, yogurt, cheeses. You immediately jump from 10 microorganisms per gram in a leaf to 1.5 million. Uh, in a gram of flesh, there's three million microorganisms, mostly yeasts. The chief undertaker is a mold and a fungus and a yeast. If you bring food which has the life force intact, it has antimycotoxic compounds and things to help keep toxins at bay, antimicrobial components in the green leaf and things which is not in the flesh in the same way. There's some acidophilus as possibly that can arise from the milk, but there's great acidophilus as arise from vegetation. So let's be kind, let's be gentle, let's be soft, let's be allowing. Let no one go home and say to grandma, that's the end of cookies, grandma. <laughs> right? Because trapped blood proteins can cause people to, to die a, a less and live a nice long life. Trapped blood proteins from emotion. So we want to be kind and gentle and soft and loud with everyone. We should not have any judgment about what someone's doing. We should just ever know what the path is for Ma and ever become aware of what Ma's business is and stick with Ma's business. Let's not get involved with somebody else's business, thank you. And let's know the difference between somebody else's business and God's business and Moi's business. So we stick, stick with one's own business as one can. We should know 
we should know what our own business is and we should do what we can to stick with our own business. And we should know if it's God's business, allow that to be with God. If it's somebody else's business, allow that to be with somebody else. Let's absolutely know what it, we are doing ourselves. So I think that uh, for the most part, Annie would have wanted you to hear uh, first that feelings are very important, that we can transform anything in the outside world uh, by having mastery more over the internal self. And that Annie would have wanted you to be aware today that it's not the stimulus of stuff, but the response, the response to this stimulus of stuff that counts. It's, it's one's own response to things that counts, not anything else. The other thing that Annie would have wanted you to know, that communication is the response that you get back from other people, not what you've said. Not what I've said, but the response I'm getting back from you is the effect of my communication. So re being responsible, being in response, res my response to you is the effect of your communication to me. Your response to me is the effect of my communication with you. So our response is our communication. We should ever be aware that it, may, it is not my intention that's the communication, but what the other's response is that is the communication. Um, the other th Annie would have wanted you to ever be aware that we have a sustainable future as we move more towards live food. And that's foods which in a semblance of this food can be found growing wild in nature. And that it is a food which has life force intact. It is a food which can reproduce itself. If, if you took the carrot or the, bur excuse me, if you took the burdock root uh, and you cut the top off and you put that top in the soil, it will grow. Lots of things will. It's still got its life force, incredibly. But an animal cannot. An animal had its life, light force and it carried it round with it. You know, and it was an astral energy battery pack, whereas the plant absorbs light from the sun and stores this within itself, in every cell. If you pick that plant you know, in, in the night, you'll notice the plant has wilted slightly. If you pick that plant uh, in the night, it always, no matter what, will remain wilted. But if you pick that as it had its full component of sunlight, it will store that sunlight and it will remain, for the most part, with that sunlight. Life begets life and dead begets dead. Only 10 microorganisms in plants uh, between one and a half million and three million microorganisms per gram when, you, when one would have moved to flesh. Uh, Anti-myco, antimicrobial, anti-fermentive types of compounds. We said at the very beginning of the lecture that uh, the chief undertaker is the mold of fungus and the yeast. Let's take a leaf. Let's tear it up. Let's look and see what happens to it it remains for quite some time. It doesn't oxidize. Take a piece of fruit, tear it up, see what happens. What happens? It oxidizes quick. There is no uh, microbial, uh, antimicrobial components and things much in the fruit as there is in the leaf. So people can have compromised their terrain and we may have to do something unnatural by bringing in leaf. We're not herbivores. We do not have a herbivore's stomach or intestinal tract. We're not carnivores either. We do not have anything like a carnivore's intestinal tract. Nothing the same as a carnivore at all. And we have very little of our intestinal tract that is as a herbivore either. Though someone may be able to heal themselves by bringing in green leaf. Green makes clean. Green makes clean. We may need to bring in green to help crate clean. Uh, and, and fruit might not quite do it, even though our digestive tract fits exactly into a frugivore's intestinal tract. It's very interesting because that person who wrote the four blood types not a mention, not a single mention in the whole of the book of somatotyping, which I'm talking about right now. That is, the person who wrote that book is not a physiologist. So how could they make the statements they've made? 
the person who wrote that book has not studied any and has no reference material in the work for how our choice of foods affect the earth. Never read a single book. There is no reference material in that work. And guess what? Here's someone who's supposed to have some insight into nutrition. Sold a lot of books. But there is no reference at all in the index, subject index, for enzymes. Now that's an error. That's a serious error. That's not a minor error. If somebody could make such a serious error that they've written a work that's about nutrition but they have no idea yet about enzymes, they have no idea about the value of enzymes, it's like, wait a minute. This is an author, obviously, that's missed the bus. We should be kind and we should be gentle. We should be soft and allowing some very small truth, but the book is extremely misleading. And the author's answer to things is wrong. Very wrong. Not just a little bit. I've never read a single book where everything was right in it. Ever. And even in my own work, there's things which need to be corrected in there. And every five years, that book could be re-edited completely. But most books, most books have a lot of stuff which is very wrong. And, and, and I've never read a book where everything is right in it. So, uh, lots of things that one can have read may not, maybe it can be a lot of misleading stuff actually. And I have to say that most of it is misleading. Because most authors haven't yet studied nutrition. They haven't studied enzymes. They haven't studied what happens to food uh, when it was cooked molecularly. It becomes hydrophobic, not miscible with water. And then you could say that whilst we're using, our cells remain nice and hydrated and has a nice amount of cytoplasm inside the cell for performing its cell function, but as we age, the cytoplasm slowly can have less than remained. And so now the cell being not quite the size it was, it less than has a nice ability to perform the functions that it should. And that's, youthing is the cells remaining hydrated and aging is the opposite. And what does this? Cooked food does this enormously. The cooking of the food causes the nutrients to become hydrophobic. Those nutrients are no longer miscible with water anymore. They're being chemically and energetically changed. So now, if we were meant to eat cooked food, all of us would have been born with stoves already attached. <laughs> and it is amazing to me that there is no other animal eating cooked food. There's not an insect or a giraffe or a whale or an ant. Matter of fact, there isn't any other life force eating cooked food. We're the only ones. Oh, I can see. It's so easy how it came about. Just imagine right now that all of us are this incredible family, which we are here, gathered. Um, and let's just say that 20 of us were out collecting food. The rest of us, we did about an hour's work. At the most, three. We're not meant to work eight, ten hours a day. That is called wage slavery. People close to the earth only do two, three hours work, that's it. But just for Brian, who asked, how could this have come to be? Just imagine right now, we're this most amazing family. Uh, Twenty of us were out there in the fields today, you know, searching. And guess what? They came back with some yams. They found some yams, wild yams. So we have wild yams, but we really don't have anything else much.
and just imagine now that you go to eat that raw yam, you go to bite into it, but it doesn't taste good to you. But others are eating it, but some are not. The others that are eating it are eating it because their chemistry are telling them they haven't, they can benefit from some of the nutrients that they could receive from that wild yam, which this instinct works if it's a food which came from nature, if it's eaten the way it came from nature and not denatured, then we have an instinct inside, we have an aliesthetic taste change that can tell us whether we need this or not. So let's just imagine that uh, 20 of us, we went out there, we, we found some yams, we brought them back, and now, let's say, as you look around, you notice that maybe three quarters of us, or maybe half of us are actually eating yams, but the rest of us, we don't seem to be care about the yam. We're just maybe not hungry for yam at all. And so you're just sitting there, and there's a bit of a social occasion, uh, and your yam rolls in toward the fire. It just rolled in toward the fire, and some time passed by, everybody else was practically done, and that fire cooked that yam. So now, just before everybody finishes eating, those of us who didn't have any yam, you know, we go, hey, what's that? Wow, that smells interesting. You know, geez, uh, 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 didn't smell that before. Wow, what's that, you know? Uh, and they notice that there's something steaming. They go, oh my God, it's a yam. Gosh, they fired the yam, they thought. It smells amazing. And then somebody goes down and they eat just a little. They go, hey, this tastes good. This tastes damn good. I can eat one of those. And I could eat another one as well. And then another one. Straight after it. What happened? I could have probably only eaten half a yam. Or maybe I didn't even care for yam. What happened? Yes, something caused me to overeat. Come on, what else? Yes. Yes, it becomes sugary. No enzymes. Come on, what else? But why is it that I didn't want it before. How come I want it now? It doesn't have any enzymes. How come? Yes. This fragrant. What else? Uh, yes, the, the sugar content is more easily absorbed. But what else? Huh? Actually, the sugar content is not really easily more easily absorbed, but it it's not managed. The sugar becomes not able to be managed very well. So, what did you? Now it's a drug. That's right. It's it's become cooked, and now it's a drug. It's not going to be able to be cleared from the body, but there's lots of other things that's a problem with it. Why was it that I didn't feel hungry for it before it was cooked? Why did all of a sudden it taste delicious to me? What's gone on? Yes? What's happened as a result of it being cooked? It changed chemically and your... What do you call it? The aliasthetic taste change. Excellent. Okay. Great student. Top student. <laughs> Going to be a test after this. <laughs> that was really good. Could you say that again? What's your name? Peter. Peter. Go ahead. Let everybody know Peter. Um, it changed chemically. And what's the word? The alle aesthetic taste change yeah, it didn't occur. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't we did not have any instinct biologically. There is no evolution for the body to adapt to cooked wild yam. Now, if we can imagine, how long have we cooked food for? And we can just put that into something recognizable. Just imagine right now the distance and how many steps it would take you if you set out for three days and you walk solid for three days. How much can the average person walk in a day? You know, bushwalking. <laughs> yes, I could do 30 miles maybe. Huh? That's a lot. Who's a bushwalker? Who's a hiker? Come on. How many can you walk? How many is the average walk? Oh my God, that's, you're, really, you're really pushing it too. Wow. 
What about the other people? I hope they were all keeping up with you. Yeah, okay. Say it again. Yeah, okay. The average person, uh, hiking-wise, you and I, if we went to go hiking, we could probably cover about eight miles in a day. That would be a pretty good hike, to have done eight miles. Okay. Can you imagine now walking for eight miles all day, and at the end of the day, you know, you take a rest, but then you walk eight miles the next day, how many steps you took, and then eight miles the day after that, how many steps you took. Can you imagine this? And now, just take seven steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You walk for three days, and you just took seven steps. That seven steps represents the amount of time we've eaten cooked food for. The three days you walked and all the steps you took represents all the time of our evolution that we haven't had cooked food. So it's, a, it's an error. And I can understand how it easily occurred. The cooked food ended up as a drug. Cooked food is a drug. But be ki kind and gentle. And some people could get mad at you if you told them that. Yeah, absolutely, they could get mad at you. My God, I tell people to drink urine therapy and they get mad at me. So. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, cave people. Cave women. <laughs> the cave women, did they cook their food? No. Very, very little. Not hardly at all. Cooking food is so new. Natives didn't either. So a yam would never have rolled the na fire. Most Native Americans hardly cooked any food at all. Um, see, we have evidence a little bit, the missionaries coming in when the natives already had started to be disturbed. We have two major tribes now left. We have the Hopi. It's the major concentration of Indians. And then we have the Lakota. Is the second major tribe. Lakota, uh, they, the French called them Sioux, which they don't like to be called the Sioux. Uh, they call themselves Lakota, but they never were in that area where they are now in the Dakotas. They were in Canada more, and the French pushed them down. I mean, and they became very nomadic, very nomadic. There was no uh, agriculture, none, and mostly they did uh, murder animals, basically. Uh, but that was fairly recent. Uh, but lots and lots of tribes of Indians that could have murdered animals, but they never did, like the Adirondacks. Who knows the Adirondacks? Heard of the Adirondacks? Absolutely. Should in New York, um, upstate New York, the Adirondacks. Uh, Adirondack means tree eater. Whilst they, they had an enormous abundance of everything they could have murdered if they wanted to, they never did. And there were quite a few natives like this, uh, tr tr families and tribes, uh, and most of the natives uh, did not cook much at all, very, very little. So there was a lot more food which was closer to the ancient diet uh, for the Native Americans than what our diet, what most people's diet is. Did you know that statistics show that in five years, that's such a short time, isn't it, really? It just sort of happens like a blink. Did you know that in five years, 80% of the food people will be eating is not the food they're eating today? Did you know that five years ago the food that people ate is 80% not the food that people are eating today? We're, it's a brand new experiment. Lots of people are eating food which we've never eaten. We've never eaten antibiotics pesticides, insecticides, fertilizer, food additives, colorants, preservatives, hormones. That's just a few of the things that is brand new. It's only about 56 years old. That's all. So older people, uh, they can have generally better health because at least uh, they had a life of growing up as children uh, without a lot of those chemicals and things. So our cho how our choice of food, uh, 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 we, vote, we vote in the art of the way we live our life by what we purchase. And so if you become more a life fooder and you move more towards life force, 
uh, then you really are living simply and allowing others to simply live. Um, how many of us, how many present are uh, flesh eaters, still eating flesh? Okay, okay. Out of those people who are eating flesh, uh, put your hand up if you have murdered animals. Okay, a couple of men. So none of the women have murdered any of the animals. And then lots of the men haven't here either, but we have a couple of men who've murdered some animals. Isn't that strange to you? Would you... I would ask you to consider what happens and if that's something that you would do. And if you would not do that, then perhaps you should move more towards vegetarianism. I recommend, as you can, to move more towards vegetarianism. I recommend, as you can, to move more towards life, food. <clears throat> and I recommend, as you can to move more toward going without and live longer by going without. Be more spiritual by being filled more uh, with this great cosmic wheel of life, by being empty, by having a full emptiness ourselves. So when we eat, when we move more towards life, life begets life, dead begets dead, we be, we, we're more empty of ourself. And then this great cosmic wheel of life comes more in with, with what this is more. And then we, st we become aware of a voice beyond ourself. We become aware of a consciousness beyond our body and beyond ourself. And if you're like me, then you become aware that I am not this body. And these words are not coming from this body. And that we open ourselves up to this voice that is beyond ourselves. And that we become more able to divine. We become more able to sense what's going on inside someone. We become more able to know what's happening below the earth. We have a greater ability to be able to divine and which for water and all sorts of things. By being more empty of ourself, this antenna becomes lit up from the top of the crown of the skull through to the heart. We have a major antenna and this antenna is open and things are flowing nicely uh, when we are empty and it doesn't quite work when we're full. We start out by saying that 80% that of the energy that you can have consumed to consider the possibility that most of that was for digesting food. That's a lot. And that there's a great savings of energy by having calorie restriction and going more without. Okay. Okay. Uh, eat life food because there is no uh, life foods are foods which in semblance can be found growing wild in nature so they are all foods which are not genetically engineered all foods which in a semblance of this food cannot be found growing wild those foods the cultivation of those foods are destroying the earth corn is destroying the earth we should not have that soy is destroying the earth all these monocrops are wiping out the soil of the earth and and they create deficiency and they cause craving and they cause people to have to consume more. And whereas it, if one only took things in that was whole and sufficient of itself, it causes us to be more whole and sufficient of ourselves, and there is no craving. If you do a life food nutritional fast, flush away your bile stones, I'll bet you my bottom dollar that there'll be days that you walk in to the grocery store or the market where you buy things and you search for stuff and you leave. Not having found anything that you would care to eat. That you get to the place where you feel more sufficient and you have to really be more willful about, well, will I have that? No, I could. Well, I don't have to. 
and it will be less like what it is for most people, a more of a craving and more sort of impulse and buying things more from craving. One can have created a place, a state of being more where one is more sufficient of oneself. Okay. Our attention span is just about 20 minutes, isn't it? I mean, we've, maybe we've gone a bit beyond that. Life food. Food, which in a semblance of this food can be found growing wild. So that's everything else except for the things I mentioned. So it's everything except for the starchy fruits and vegetables. Most vegetables are, happen to be fruits, actually. Most people are unaware of what a fruit is. A fruit really is something which came from, excuse me, came from a flower. Anything that came from a flower is a fruit. So a nut is a fruit. Most vegetables like the tomato and uh, your pepper and a cucumber and these things and a, uh, squash and things. These are fruits. They're not vegetables. Pardon? Uh, yes, but... Um, yes, tomato has. Uh, but, uh, you know, the more you move more towards the heirloom, um, there is tomato growing wild still. Tomato, though it can have been hybridised, tomato is not hybrid, whereas corn is. There is no such thing as corn not being hybrid, whereas tomato does still can be found growing wild. Um, we should move more towards the heirloom uh, uh, types of uh, fruits and things because they have a lot more abundance of everything in it. It is interesting that Rutgers University did a study that showed uh, on average about 80% more nutrients in organic produce on average. On average. There can be 600% more nutrients in organic produce than commercially grown produce. But on average, it's about 80% more nutrients in organic produce. So you're, you're not equating organic with heirloom? Uh, 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 heirloom, uh, no, because the heirloom could have been grown more with, with uh, superphosphate and nitrates and things. Heirloom simply means that they started with a seed that is close to the original fruit. Um, that's all. Um, but... So, but organic would mean then they did not use any animal dung on the ground. They did not use any blood and bone meal on the ground. See, these are questions that we should make sure that organic means none of that stuff. There should be not, none of that because that's not organic. Sometimes I'll ask people and they'll yes. say, we used uh, horse manure. And right. Say, well, what did you feed the horses? Or, you know. Yeah. Um, in my mind... Uh, that's not organic, really, no. Uh, no. Uh, it, it's not really meant to be that way, not really. You know, there's so many ways to create, create the, the necessary nutrient in the soil than having to husband animals and collect their dung and put that on the ground. In my mind, I think that's not organic and that's not natural. So questions like this should be answered more. Mold and fungus. Yes, we always use ferments and bacteria in the soil to create, you know, this sort of uh, the nutrients because it's the bacteria in the soil which helps biologically transmutate one mineral, mineral into another, um, and it's the bacteria that in that give the mineral the proper colloids and things, not the soil itself. Yes. Okay, I know that we just have a few minutes left and I want to make sure that we wrap this up. Is there any burning question that somebody has? Okay, good question. That's probably one of the better questions we've had, right? To wrap things up on. Go ahead and ask it again, make it, make it really loud. What can we do about it? What can we do about the chief cause of death the chief undertaker, which is mold and fungus and yeast. What can we do to keep the chief undertaker at bay? We can bring in, in the, the substances which help block pleomorphic organisms and have uh, antimicrobial components. So the green leaf has this. Uh, fruit doesn't quite have it to the same degree. Um, so we need to bring in green leaf. Green makes clean. Uh, we, examples, 
uh, parsley, marvelous. Uh, all the leaves. Um, but let's go. I'm not just going to talk about the vegetables, right, that are green. Let's go to some which is in nature because they're the things that really can heal you. Golden leaf, golden seal leaf, echinacea leaf. Oh, we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about soil borne organisms in a second. Um, Pau d'arco leaf. Dandelion leaf. Thank you, Casper. That's a good one. Hmm? No, dandelion root's good too, but leaf. We go to leaf to get really have the antimicrotoxic compounds and antimicrobial compounds. No, uh, it should be blended. They should be done more as a fresh compress, a fresh compound, excuse me. should be done as a fresh compound. We should learn how to take the herb as a fresh compound. Once it's cooked or it's juiced or something like that, it's no longer a whole food. It's missing vital electrics and elements. Uh, which will rob things from the body. There's mucilaginous properties in things. If you blend something which is present, but if you juice, it's no longer present. Juicing is not really a whole food. Some juicing is okay, but we really should stick mostly with whole foods as we can. And we could blend those. As long as it's still with the topic of what do we do with mold and fungus and yeast? Okay. 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 Uh, there is no such thing as an essential amino acid. That is faulty research. There is no such thing as an essential fatty acid. That is faulty research. Okay? Uh, that question about protein is coming from the meat, the egg, and the dairy board education. That's all. To sell those foods. There is no reason for protein. You could stay away from protein the rest of your life and you would be perfectly fine. I have perfectly stayed away from protein. That, that, you eat protein that will not build muscle. Absolutely not. You eat protein that will not cause you to gain or lose weight. No. But most every person who starts to go to live food or does a live food nutritional fast, if you've eaten soggy cardboard, if you've mostly consumed food which is like soggy cardboard, if you set out for 40 days, you're going to lose a lot of weight. You're going to lose all the soggy cardboard you can. And no matter what, if you have soggy cardboard there, you stop eating, you're going to lose weight. No question about it. But if you, if you did some power lifting and you're not so acidic in here, it's possible that you could actually uh, build lean tissue. You could build lean tissue and reduce adipose tissue. You could do this. Uh, but for most of us, we're so acidic in here, um, we're so built of soggy cardboard that we actually lose weight. But most people actually are, could be fat, skinny people. Uh, very little muscle at all, but lots of fat. And so that we've, if, you would, if you would fast, then we lose that fat and then one can look fairly thin because it was a fat that was filling the body, not muscle at all. So uh, it is a good thing... We, I've got five minutes. It is a good thing. Um, it is a good thing to fast. It is a good thing to lose that weight. If the body wants to lose that weight, it will lose that weight. Once you've, once you've lost all the soggy cardboard, the body will be built back with good integrity and then no matter what, if you set out for 40 days, you'll come back the same. You won't have lost an ounce. You'll come back the same. You won't have consumed anything for 40 days and you won't ha not have lost anything at all. Um, it, once the body's built out of good integrity, once your body is used to tapping into zero-point energetics, which all of us are to some degree, but if you eat cooked food, you're not tapping into free energy quite the same way. And you're actually having a more of an energy drain. But free energy burns clean. Whereas all solid fuels burn with a bit of soot and some stuff really burns unclean. I'm talking about a life food nutritional fasting, which, which this kind of fasting is really like a steam shovel. 
and so you need energy to fuel this steam shovel. Uh, and it basically is blended food. You can put anything in your blender as long as it's not starch, flesh, or cooked. And that's so very important that you keep your blood sugar level. And that's so very important that you keep your salinity level. We heard Martin talk about how important sea salt is, and it could just about replace urine. Just about. But it's so very beneficial. We hear messages out there, apparently salt's less than excellent. And that's A, true. If it's cooked, you should put the skull and crossbones on it. It is dead. And it will create problems. It will create thyroid problems and all sorts of challenges. But, but a living salt is amphoretic. It, in the presence of a base, it can become an acid. In the presence of an acid, it be, can, can become a base. The uh, isotopes, the minerals are isotopes. And at about 200 feet below the surface of the water, ionization has occurred. All those minerals and things in so sun-dried salt are more isotopes, very, very powerful. Uh, not the same at all as cooked salt. Cooked salt is very dead. Uh, life begets life and dead begets dead. You can really do some wonderful things. You can biologically transmutate the minerals in the sea salt into anything that you need. So we like to salt things in the beginning because that keeps people's blood volume. Most people, when they fast, they could have felt feeble. And they may have felt feeble because they lost the minerals content of their blood and so then the body had to reduce the fluid. And so then the blood volume can have decreased and that can, of course, the person... To, on their fasting to have not that much energy, right? So we, slight, we salt things a little bit more in the beginning of our fast and we blend things. You bring in flaxseed, sesame seed, pumpkin seed, fresh ground introduced into things. Less is better than more. There's no breakfast. No eating late at night. Stomach has to be empty. The intestinal tract has to rest where there is nothing in the intestinal tract after defecation. And that's life food nutrition fasting. Anyway, uh, how about a big hand for, for coming up, for showing up today? Come on. Woo!